facts include ATF did not pursue options less risky than the raid. The agents didn't have the necessary expertise. Intelligence was faulty. And it was a TV cameraman who inadvertently tipped the cult. This disturbing picture of federal law enforcement agents out of control came to light just as Randy Weaver and his friend Kevin Harris went on trial in federal court in Idaho for the murder of U.S. Marshal William Deegan at Ruby Ridge. The confrontation in which Weaver's wife and 14-year-old son were shot and killed. Weaver's defense, self-defense against trigger-happy federal agents who had come to arrest him. The verdict, not guilty. Weaver was convicted only of two lesser charges. White supremacists outside the courthouse were jubilant. Tell the truth, and the truth will make you free. What do you think did it for him? Yahweh! Hallelujah! Critics say the government botched the case. The government's own egregious misbehavior and misconduct uh, helped extraordinarily in, in generating the acquittals in this case. There are eerie parallels with Waco. In both cases, government miscalculation in the arrest of a fanatic ended in gunfire and death. In this case, many believe government miscalculations in the courtroom handed victory to the fanatics. The eerie parallels with Waco came into even sharper focus in January of 1994, when 11 surviving Branch Davidians went on trial in Texas for the deaths of the four federal agents killed in that botched raid. Once again, defense lawyers plan to argue that an overzealous U.S. government was responsible for the death and the violence. What we're really going to see is sort of a view into government conduct, and it's really, regardless of the outcome, it's going to be a question of the government on trial. The verdict some six weeks later suggested another moral victory for those who had claimed to be defending themselves from government assault. All 11 Branch Davidians were acquitted of conspiracy and murder charges. Five were convicted of voluntary manslaughter. The only people that were convicted of a of the serious offense of voluntary manslaughter, the jury had to first find that the government had provoked that action by its own actions. Two defendants were found guilty of weapons charges, but four of the 11 were found not guilty of any charges, including a very emotional Clive Doyle. Well, I'm very happy to be uh, free today. But it's somewhat of a hollow victory because this lost our friends and not walking out with us. The not guilty verdicts reverberated most strongly among the radical right, who were already convinced that the federal government was dead set on eradicating fundamental individual liberties. Waco and Ruby Ridge has changed America because for the militia movement and those that were looking at some ideological uh, cornerstone to attach their conspiracy theories to and uh, to organize around, these have become sort of watershed uh, events of the government coming after ordinary citizens. And we don't need anybody from Washington, from any place else, telling us how we should live or how we should do things. And if the government continues to distance itself from the people, and it can, continues to alienate the people from it, then war is inevitable, revolution is inevitable. Commence firing. And we're not going to be enslaved. The militia movement has taken these two tragic instances and recast these events into a latter-day government coming down uh, on individuals uh, on a really massive, evil, pernicious level. But it wasn't just the far right that was disenchanted with the federal government. Americans of all political persuasions rose up in November of 1994 to elect the most conservative congressional majority in nearly half a century. The people were tired of big government, wasteful spending, dumb bureaucracies, and ineffective red tape. While it was hardly at the top of their agenda, many in the new Republican Congress, many newly elected legislators, shared the constituents' frustration over the actions of the ATF and the FBI at Waco and Ruby Ridge. If the Congress would open up again what happened at Waco and lay everything on the table, God, if our government would be honest with us for a change, then the people wouldn't need to feel this kind of anger. But while the new Congress did promise to conduct hearings into those tragic events, a few angry and violent Americans decided to take things into their own hands, to send the country a terrible message of their own. 
That story when the 20th century returns. In 1995, the new Republican House and Senate began a round of investigations into what happened at Ruby Ridge and Waco. And that seemed a surprising turnabout for traditionally law and order conservatives to be criticizing law enforcement professionals. But for many outside Washington, the promised new round of hearings was not enough. What they wanted was revenge. <laughs> About a third of the building has been blown away. April 19th, 1995. A powerful bomb goes off at the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, housing 15 federal agencies. Among them, ATF officers on the top floor. Some 900 people are believed to be inside. A stretcher! Including dozens of children at a daycare center called America's Kids. Make no mistake about it, this was an attack on the United States, our way of life, and everything we believe in. We will find the people who did this. By the time the body count was finally complete, 168 had died, including 19 children. If this is not a crime for which capital punishment is called, I don't know what is. At first, government sources believe the Oklahoma blast had, quote, Middle East terrorism written all over it. Then came possibility of a revenge bombing against any of the federal agencies in the building. It was the date of the bombing, April 19th, that led investigators to suspect that the root of the terror in America's heartland may have been homegrown. A Montana militia newsletter obtained by CBS News points to April 19th, the day of the bombing, as a day for action. It was on April 19th of 1993, the newsletter says, that the Branch Davidian complex in Waco was burned and April 19, 1992, that alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agents first tried to raid white supremacist Randy Weaver's home in Idaho. For the militia movement, April 19th became the equivalent of Pearl Harbor. And they've created this image of April 19th as the date the government really started its war against the American people. And that is why that date resonates and continues to resonate with this movement. A movement in which the bad guys were the ones wearing the badges. The ATF are the criminals, not me. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I didn't shoot Randy Weaver's wife in the face. I didn't murder 80-some people at Waco. I cannot believe that any serious patriotic American believes that the conduct of those people at Waco justifies the kind of outrageous behavior we've seen here at Oklahoma City or the kind of inflammatory rhetoric that we're hearing all across this country today. ATF As the Oklahoma City investigation continued, Congress opened new hearings into what happened at Waco and Ruby Ridge. If you would raise your right hand, please, uh, gentlemen. Do you swear or affirm that... Robert Rodriguez, undercover agent for the ATF, testified that he warned two supervisors that David Koresh knew the raid at the Branch Davidian compound was about to begin. He was shaking real bad. He was breathing real hard. And I'm looking at him. And again, he turns to me and says, they're coming, Robert. The time has come. Rodriguez telephoned his bosses that surprise was blown just before the raid helicopters took off. Moments later, ATF agents walked into a hail of bullets. Rodriguez's superior said they thought he was only repeating one of Koresh's frequent prophecies of doom. Those two men know, know what I told them, and they knew exactly what I meant. And, and instead of coming up, and, and admitting to the American people, instead of doing that, they lied to the public. And the mistakes made by ATF agents in the original raid were compounded, officials said, by the way the FBI then escalated tensions during the 51-day standoff that followed. I've looked at several cases involving the FBI, including Waco. I've noticed some troubling patterns. Traditionally, the Bureau relied on negotiations to bring about a peaceful settlement of hostage or barricade situations. Lethal force was distant. Uh, it was a last alternative. 
the number one what changed said senator grassley was that the fbi's hostage rescue team was led by a former army officer that unit trained with the u.s military where they learned the rules of dealing with foreign sieges and then applied them at home the presumption was to use a hostile solution before negotiations this is the same upside down strategy used at ruby ridge the subcommittee this morning opens hearings on what happened at ruby ridge idaho more than three years ago in august of 19 in his testimony before the senate randy weaver turned out to be a sympathetic yeah. witness i've said things that have been wrong i've done things that were wrong and i've paid a big a very heavy price for those things in his formal testimony he took responsibility for his own mistakes he even questioned some of his extremist anti-government views i'm not without fault in this matter i was convicted of failure to appear for trial on charges i had sold a sawed off shotgun to an atf informant if i had it to do over again knowing what i know now i would make different choices i'd come down from the mountain for the court appearance but my wrongs did not cause federal agents to commit crimes. Nothing I did caused federal agents to violate the Constitution of the United States. I have been accountable for my choices. They should be held accountable for their wrongs. But no federal agents... But agent finding those wrongs was easier said than done. The committee could not determine who started the original gunfight at Ruby Ridge, which left young Sammy Weaver dead, and who in FBI headquarters had approved the so-called rules of engagement later found to be unlawful, which resulted in the fatal shooting of Vicki Weaver. Several of you within the top echelons of the FBI were, were operating under different notions of what the rules of engagement really were. Is that correct? It's, it's apparent now that, that we were, yes, sir. Larry Potts was one of the two in charge at FBI headquarters in Washington at the time of Ruby Ridge. FBI snipers at the site claimed to have shoot-to-kill orders that came from the top command. In your judgment, who gave the approval? The highest authority that I know of was Mr. Potts. But Potts said he didn't remember it that way at all. Yeah, yeah. Glenn and I never discussed the can and should language of the rewritten rules of engagement. I believe that it's embarrassing that we cannot even determine who approved rules of engagement that were drafted in part at FBI headquarters. Rules which, when put into play, led to the death of Vicki Weaver. It's a mystery made even more frustrating for the Senate by FBI Director Louis Free's decision to promote Potts to the number two job in the Bureau, despite Ruby Ridge. Uh, why did uh, Director Free uh, promote you, uh, in your opinion, Mr. Potts? After his review of... Uh of the incident, uh, he did not believe that it should prevent me from occupying that position. I think there is a strong indication here that the initial investigation and even the oversight investigation by FBI either failed to recognize the problems or ignored them. A position the FBI director himself came to adopt after a scathing independent critique from the Justice Department. I noted before the rules of engagement adopted for Ruby Ridge were so poorly worded that they could have been interpreted to direct agents to act contrary to the Bureau's deadly force policy. FBI employees exhibited improper judgment, neglect of duty, or failure to exert proper managerial oversight. These are serious shortcomings, unacceptable in life or death situations like Ruby Ridge. The FBI director disciplined a dozen agents involved at Ruby Ridge, including Deputy Director Larry Potts, just two months after Potts had been promoted. The irony of the Weaver trial is that everybody involved would have been better off to play by the rules. Randy Weaver, would, who was ultimately acquitted, would have been well advised to appear for his court date rather than hide out on this mountaintop and challenge the government to get him. The FBI would have been much better advised to treat this case like any other, treat it as a you know, garden variety bank robbery uh, and play by the rules rather than trying to bend them. The U.S. government paid $3.1 million to settle Randy Weaver's $200 million wrongful death lawsuit. And in the fall of 1995, the FBI put new rules into effect on the use of deadly force.
Essentially, it says deadly force can be used only when necessary and only when agents have a reasonable belief they or someone else are in imminent danger. The congressional hearings into Waco and Ruby Ridge did nothing to stop the swelling of the militia movement into the tens of thousands. And no one in the Congress suggested holding hearings about that. One possible reason, racism. Imagine for a second that the Oklahoma City bombing happened on April 19th and the two people arrested uh, and charged with that bombing were two black Americans, two Arab Americans associated with a movement of 10 to 40,000 armed, either black or Arab Americans, um, that were talking about the need to have war with the federal government and arming for that purpose. You would have seen members of Congress leaving skid marks to hold massive hearings into that. God bless America! But because this is predominantly a white movement and a white male movement, um, it's taken with a lot less seriousness than I think it ought to be. Some final thoughts on Waco, Ruby Ridge, and the militia movement when the 20th century returns. Barry Goldwater once said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. But in the cases of Ruby Ridge and Waco, it appeared that a handful of Americans pushed that proposition far beyond anything Goldwater had ever imagined. Some federal law enforcement agents, in their pursuit of justice, seemed to forget the virtue of moderation. And private citizens turned so extreme in their anger at their own government that they decided to embark on violent acts to defend their liberty. As long as those two groups remained bitterly at odds with each other, they continued to make a mockery of the words Americans had committed to memory when they first learned to recite their Pledge of Allegiance to one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th Century. Now available from a and &E Home Video, 20th Century with Mike Wallace. Re-examine some of the significant events of this century and see how they will continue to affect our future. Call 1-800-423-1212. And for $99.95 plus shipping and handling, you can own this collector set. 11 episodes on 5 video cassettes of 20th Century with Mike Wallace. Call now, 1-800-423-1212. imagination to the far reaches of the galaxy on an all-new A&E special presentation Where Are All the UFOs at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific And now, Internal Affairs pays a visit to Captain Cragen in a cover-up that's sure to rock the house Law and Order is next on A&E